Welcome to the Houdini 18 Masterclass on Vellum. Um, this one is going to focus on some of the new cloth tools that have been added. I'm going to start off with our good friend Tommy. Let's just take the default geometry here. And as a reminder, before we start this, uh, our test geometry is designed to be uh, intentionally bad geometry to stress various things. So we're going to see some of that in this process. I'm going to start off by splitting out the um, clothes from the rest of Tommy. So get the tank top and the body. Oops, not the body. I wish the uh, pants. Here we go. And separate them off and make a vellum cl configure cloth out of this. And I can wire the um, body into the second input as a collider. And now do a vellum solver. And we can then see how this works with default settings in um, Houdini 18 some of these default settings have changed. So if I hit play, uh, we'll see the cloth is obviously way too stretchy. There's not enough substeps being done here, so there's no way for it to uh, converge. Um, but uh, there is uh, a couple things that have changed. So first, let's just change the uh, substep rate to 5 uh, to get a better cloth simulation. One thing we have found over continued experience is that substeps is definitely the first thing you want to increase to improve quality of cloth, especially for stretchiness. We used to suggest it was a balance between this and constraint iterations. Usually we find it's always better to do sub-steps. Uh, the more sub-steps you do, the less there is each iteration to perform. So doing double the sub-steps is usually better than doing twice the constraint iterations. The trouble with more sub-steps is that it gets expensive due to more collision passes. Um, so if you're starting to optimize a setup, usually you can find that you can start to reduce your collision passes down when sub-steps get very large uh, to try and minimize the amount of actual collision passes that are done. So there is still, unfortunately, a bit of uh, art to that balance, um, but uh, that's probably the direction you want to optimize in. So in this way, we have a cloth that is sticking together a little bit better. And um, so it's not entirely bad, especially since we have some rather bogus geometry coming into here. You can see the, the um, bent over um, uh, geometry at the seams of the original cloth, especially if I go back up here to the split here, these pant legs actually go right inside this shirt. Um, so this is why we get all that tangling right from the outset. So let's now compare first to what this looked like um, in Houdini 17.5 and earlier. So I'm going to just make sure I'm the first frame. And control C, Control V, the, the setup. And let's change to how it used to be. So the big changes now is mass changes to calculate and varying. Um, it used to be the mass was um, set uniform, so every single particle got the same mass. The problem with this is that uh, it made for rather unrealistic uh, stretch settings. So uh, this didn't matter too much for stiffness um, because the stiffness is usually 1E10, so it's pretty much infinite. Um, but it does matter a lot for bend. So we found the uh, bend settings would not uh, correspond between different uh, cloth resolutions very well, which was very frustrating. Um, but by having the mass computed properly, that indeed does start to work. So as we change our resolution of our mesh, we should see similar bend behavior provided convergence has occurred. Um, the problem is that um, if I go to mass and do the um, point 0.1, we're going to have very different uh, stiffness amounts. Um, because that means that the points are incredibly heavy, so a stiffness of uh, 1e minus 4 like this will uh, not be able to hold it at all. Uh, by comparison, if I used the original uh, 0.1 stiffness and had used um, very lightweight mass that's computed, we'd end up with uh, very uh, unbendable cloth. If I look at the geometry spreadsheet, we can actually see the effect here. So if I look at mass, it's 0.1 currently. In the new setup, we actually get a mass of 1e minus 6, which is very light because these are very small triangles with a very thin cloth, but it is a more realistic mass value. Um, this second one that is set is uh, the thickness. So this is a particularly uh, important one because the first rule we usually told people in the old setup was uh, check your thickness, check your thickness, check your thickness. Because if you had the p-scale wrong, you'd have a very slow simulation and get some, some weird artifacts when things uh, split apart and try to hold back together again. And uh, it seemed rather annoying to have to 
constantly check that. So we instead have a system which tries to automatically calculate thickness from the incoming geometry. So there's also an option now in vellum cloth to visualize what the computed thickness is. So with this on, I can display the vellum cloth and it'll show me how big it made these uh, points. So it made this a rather thin cloth. Um, this is done by uh, looking at one of the percentiles of the um, edge length and multiplying by 0 0.25 to create something which is roughly something that will work everywhere. You know, in the very fine area here, these are obviously too thick because uh, these points are way too close together in this direction. Um, so they'll end up uh, being reduced, but overall it's correct. And it's definitely way better than if we use the uh, set uniform thickness that was our default before, um, where it would be way too thick everywhere and especially uh, ridiculously too thick on these places where we had this extra bent over geometry. So if I reset this all thus to the default settings, we can look at how that would simulate. And so this is how the default simulation would have worked with substeps 5 in 17.5. You'll note that it's running a lot slower. Um, this is because we had all that overlap, um, so it's not able to uh, quickly discard a lot of these collisions. We're also getting bad artifacts around the... Um, the tank top because we have those overlapping points that are probably slipping out and then um, trying to expand their effective p-scale. So we can see that in, in effect if we go to the vellum solver and visualize the thickness, we can see here things have been shrunk hugely from the default values and when we're getting these problems we have stuff that has expanded outwards. See that guy's grown to almost its full size, which is very frustrating because it shouldn't be its full size there. Um, nothing really should be that full size. So with this automatic setting of both uh, thickness and mass, we found we've had a lot more resolution in independence, which is quite exciting. So let's see some of that in action by actually changing the resolution of our cloth. So I'm going to do a poly reduce. If we look at the uh, poly reduction, let's cut this to 25%. And uh, we notice at first it's kind of a yucky mesh, especially for cloth simulations. This is because poly reduce tries to optimize for flat areas. So it sees long, it'll happily make long skinny triangles um, like along here to uh, get the fewest number of triangles with the uh, best results. But with cloth, we don't know how the cloth's going to bend. So it's important to have a more uniform cloth uh, uh, triangle size. Another option for this, of course, is the remesh sop. Um, you can change equalize edges and push this up to 0.1, and then we'll get a much uh, more sane mesh for the purpose of uh, simulation. The other interesting thing to look at here is the UV seams. Um, there is the automatic um, uh, vertex seams set. If I change that to zero, uh, we'll start to see bad seams uh, show up along like the crotch here where the two uh, UV attributes are are going to be fighting each other. More obvious, probably in the UV viewport where we can see that um, bad um, edges. Well, so if I put in a value of one, we now have straight UV seams and we don't leave the original UV space. So given the polar reduced cloth, I can send that in. And now I don't have to change anything else. Um, I'll have the same general behavior um, except it'll be uh, now done uh, with a low-resolution cloth, and so run a lot faster. But the bend settings will be the same as if I'd converged with the high-resolution cloth. Let's also change the um, resolution of the base mesh. So I'm going to cut this one also to 25%. And then I'm going to have Tommy lose some weight just for uh, more, to allow the cloth to slide a bit more, otherwise it doesn't move very much. So I'm going to do a peak sop. And, uh, it's going to lose a fair bit of, oops, I gained some weight there. There we go. Ah, it's scary. So now with the lightweight Tommy, We can see the um, cloth falls down um, pretty quickly, but we also see something interesting happening here, um, where these tangled up points in the uh, 
in the where the shirt and the pants meet, and this is because they were self-intersected in the original model, and so they're not able to quite rip out the way we would like. There's a couple of different ways we can approach that, some of them relatively new with uh, 18. One of the things with 18 is the idea of a multi-pass um, solve. And so this is in the advanced multi-pass solve page. And what this does is with things like cloth simulations where you don't expect any stretching, it can basically detect areas that have too much stretch, in this case a 0.5 ratio of stretch, and then start to disable points around there in order to ensure that uh, they can untangle. Because usually anything stretched that much uh, will be because there's some collision that's failing. So by disabling it, we can free it up and we stop having these individual points sort of catch in somewhere and then causing these hugely stretched triangles as a result. Um, so if I turn this on, we actually should be able to see a result where it just breaks free right away. Um, this also does multi-passes, so when it breaks it free in that way, it redoes that particular iteration. So it can take up to 10 times longer to do a frame with this um, if it needed all the passes and hadn't yet broken it free, but it's usually two or three times slower. Uh, we find in practice, because usually it's able to break things out by enough disables. Another choice besides uh, multi-pass solve is uh, we could just start them off disabled. So we want to select the points along there and have them all set to auto disabled off. So what we can do in, uh, this is possible in, of course, uh, Houdini 17.5, but there is a um, neater way of doing it now. I can do an attribute paint so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually paint the points that I want to have uh, disabled. I'll go here to Attribute Paint and um, change which attribute to paint to paint on the Disable Self attribute. And make the attribute type an integer type. And now I can go enter the paint state. I'll shrink my box down a bit and change my color to 2. And I'll be painting a uh, disable value of 2. For some reason, reset there. Okay, there we go. Um, and now I'm just going to paint around this waste section. Okay, I don't know why those got set. Just disable, disable, disable. There we go. And I think that got everything. So we set this workaround in um, the later, in, in, uh, if you're on the gold release. After that, we do not need the workaround. And the result is I can go down to my film solver and look at the uh, failed self-collisions. And we can see we've started off with these already flagged as failed self-collisions. And if I go to the geometry spreadsheet, we will see that the disable self is set to 2, which is the flag meaning that these are not just disabled, but they should auto-re-enable as soon as they're not tangled. So the solver will start turning these off as soon as we start the simulation. I did that too quickly to see, so I'll go frame at a time. You can see here it started turning them all off as soon as they're free, and thus we have no tangling whatsoever. And what's nice, if the plant, pants and uh, t-shirt now recontact each other, they will collide properly as we expect. Now we don't have to restrict ourselves um, to this resolution. So having done this at this particular resolution, we can go off and turn off the poly reduction. And of course, at this point, if we look at that of paint, um, we're gonna have a bunch of randomized points painted because the point numbers don't correspond at all. But attribute paint has the ability to, um, to recache. So I can recache the strokes and then it will reapply those strokes in the um, high res geometry. So now I've selected it in the high res and applied the disable self. And so if I go down to the vellum solver, Uh, we can see, again, it quickly disables them all, and we end up with uh, expected behavior. There we go. And another way we can handle this is not by using attribute paint, um, but we can go and um, set collision groups. So in Houdini 18, we have uh, the idea of not just disabling 
self collisions or disable an external collisions with a, at a point level, but points can also disable whether or not they collide with any other point. This uses the collision ignore attribute, which was already being used to collide with SDFs, but now can be used to collide with um, other points in the geometry. So to show this into effect, I'm going to first start off with a attribute angle just to set up the collision ignore attribute. And set this to a set collision ignore equals, and if I say star, that will ignore all geometry. Um, so if I now run this, you should see it. Ignore all the geometry and run right through it, as we expect. Now I'm going to um, create some collision groups to explicitly ignore this. So if I if there is a default collision group called external, and so I can use this to avoid colliding with uh, the external geometry, which is the uh, body. So now we will no longer ignore it. So now we've, we're actually colliding with the body. But it is also not colliding with the shirt. So we notice there's no... Um, uh, self collisions with the shirt are occur occurring on here, but there'll also be no self collisions between the shirt and the shirt or the pants and the pants. So if we want to um, only disable the collisions with the um, shirt if we're on the pants and with the pants if we're on the shirt, um, we'll want to collision ignore probably just the name of the thing we don't want. Um, so what we can do is we first have to create those names. So I can uh, create a um, name SOP. And I'm going to create a collision group based off the group name. So here yeah, I'll do collision group as the attribute and uh, not do a name in, but instead name from group. And here put in the tank, uh, what is tank top and pants. So anything matching these patterns will turn into the name attribute, which in this case is collision group. So if we look at the geometry spreadsheet here, the name has in the geometry spreadsheet um, and the point level, the primitive level, sorry, set the collision group to match the, uh, the collision group that we've specified in the group. So I now want to uh, attribute promote that to make it a point attribute. And promote this from primitive to point. And then if I middle click, I should see that we now have a collision group point attribute and we have a collision ignore point attribute. So the collision ignore can point to um, the collision group, just like we could uh, have a star here. So the star would match um, both of the collision values and thus um, do what, what we expect. So if I instead change this to, for example, uh, tank top, I think it's this. I might just check I've got the right spelling there. Um, point is tank underscore top, no tank, no underscore. This, I can now set the t-shirt, the, sorry, the pants, to ignore the tank top. And do another collision ignore. And here I can set the tank top to ignore the pants. And now I'll have the tank top and the pants not colliding. Um, but they will collide with themselves, they will collide with the external geometry, and they will uh, collide with any other vellum geometry we want to add to the scene. Okay, so let's turn this off and return to our um, broken system where it will catch on the edges. What I'm going to do now is just temporarily remove the um, shirt. And instead of trying to um, uh, fix this, I'm going to go through and instead add a belt. So I'm going to first go here and blast out the shirt. So 
So we have just the pants, which are going to fall off. Um, but I'm going to, and I don't need this anymore. Do a vellum attached to geometry. Oops, wrong place. Put it in here. So this is currently attaching every single point to the geometry. Obviously, don't want that. So I'll do here edges. Let's select the edges. And um, I want to try and get in here and select one of these edges right in here. And then I can use the hints are over here. Uh, I can do A, Control A or Shift A or whatever to do a full middle mouse button area. So I want to do an A click with the middle mouse button. So holding down A and clicking middle mouse, I've now selected that entire edge. Just hit enter. And now I've got a um, attachment constraint um, between the edge and the Tommy body. And so if we solve this, we can see that the um, we are not indeed falling down anymore, which is slightly better. But there is something subtly wrong with how this uh, attachment constraint worked. So if I look at the, um, the belt here and I turn on the attached to geometry constraint visualizers, I would change this size down so it doesn't get in the way. Uh, we can see how the attached to geometry constraints are working. They're forming these sort of uh, chopstick wires that stick between the two points and keep the same length there. And so in this case, um, are, are they rotate down, um, causing the pants to actually fall down slightly because they weren't against the surface to begin with. Um, while they're kept the same distance away, they're not kept the same distance away from the skin, they're kept the same distance away from that original point. So they can end up falling right next to the skin and we lose like a centimeter of uh, pant height this way. Uh, one way to change that that we sort of did in the past is we'd change the rest length scale down. In other words, we'd suck the pants right into the uh, original skin, and then there's less room for them to rotate down so it wouldn't fall as much. Um, but this is troublesome if you actually do want, you've lost that original position of the, the pants. Um, so if you want to maintain that, that is, doesn't work very well. So the other choice we have is um, new in 18, which is tangent stiffness. Tangent stiffness um, applies uh, stiffness not just along uh, this axis point in between the two points, but also sort of in the plane vertically. So the, uh, this point will be uh, restricted um, up and down and left and right to this location and back and forth to that distance from the other point. The default value is 1,000 here. Um, so that's going to be strong enough to keep the, uh, uh, the pants probably from rotating. So we can see here that weird fold, of course, unfolds, uh, dropping the pants. Um, but we do these pin constraints do indeed keep us loosely to that uh, surface slightly offset from the skin. These will properly obey the deformation of the skin. So if it's transforming um, the orientation, this would update as, as you expect. Another type of uh, constraint added in 18 is um, similar to this. It's an attachment constraint, but it uh, involves pinning. So I'm going to just uh, go back and fortunately I selected those points non-procedurally. So I'll eliminate that. Instead, I'm going to blast out and keep only the um, lead the pants, don't lead the tank top. I'm going to add a pocket to, uh, to Tommy's um, shirt here. Start off with a planar patch. So here's my planar patch and just uh, visualize down oh, there it is. Okay, move this up. Let's change the size down considerably. And edge length down to 0.01. I've got a similar edge length in both. And now I want to just uh, eyeball this down to be roughly on top of his uh, shirt. Make it slightly offset. And what we'll do is we'll just use a, a ray sop to finish the job here. So I'll send along normals and towards the rays. There we go. Now it's against the surface. Add a little bit of lift. Just pull it off the surface. 
and um, we also want to have names for these four seams. So I'll turn on the left seam, right seam, and bottom seam names, and merge together the um, two pieces of cloth. So now we have both the pocket and the shirt in one simulation. And then I play, of course, uh, make sure we don't have a current flag. You can see that the um, pocket, of course, falls right off because we've not attached it. So I have to do a vellum constraints. This adds a generic constraint type. I can go in the generic constraint type and change the type to pin. Stitch, sorry, not stitch points, not pin points. And uh, then I want to pick what I pin from and what I pin to. So I go from uh, points and I grab the, the three point groups, the left and the right. So I'm pinning these points and I'll be pinning them onto um, the primitive group, which is the tank top. So now we see we're attaching them directly like that. Previously, um, the, this would have uh, use closest location on primitive turned off because in um, 17.5, we didn't have that option in this case. If we were stitching points, they always had to be a point-to-point -point stitch. So something like this, you'd have to find the closest point and hope there was something close enough to make it work. Um, but now we're able to have these pinned to points within the geometry, and so we can have a much better pin like this. And we can also then, um, uh, as we play, we'll see we'll get the... get the uh, patch of cloth properly stuck onto the surface. Now, the uh, one, one trouble you notice here, of course, is there's a gap between the two. In this case, it's because we have, um, if we turn on stitch points, we can see we actually have a non-zero rest length. And so just like the tangent stiffness before, you see they rotate downwards um, to reflect whatever distances they're allowed to have. Um, for this case, I'd probably want to change my rest length scale down in order to have it uh, reduced. There's still going to be a gap because um, there's still collisions between the two layers. So the thickness of the, of the piece of cloth here and the thickness of the underlying tank top means that these can't ever become coincidence. It's not like a welded point where we actually disable collision detection and make it one geometry. This sort of stitch allows us to have a slight gap you have to somehow de deal with in post-processing um, if you're using this sort of approach to stitch stuff together. But it's certainly nice that we can have it arbitrarily positioned. This becomes more obvious if we uh, change the resolution of our underlying t-shirt. So if I turn the poly reduce back on, uh, we can now see we've attached to a much lower res uh, system, and we're able to do that a lot more precisely. If we hadn't had this ability, um, when we did the stitch, uh, we would have this sort of attachment. You can see we'd end up having to pull the thing apart in some very unusual ways, because we'll try and do the reduced rest length to these entirely incorrect locations. There's some neat uh, bonus things that are now possible with this, such as sliding, which I think will be covered in another masterclass. So I'll let you look forward to that. The next big thing that was done in 18 for cloth is uh, to deal with velocity blending, uh, both with the reference frames and with uh, blending with attachments. So to show that, I'm going to load a old hip file, uh, which you might know from the previous masterclass. Um, in the uh, previous masterclass that came out after 17.5, I had some examples showing how to do um, reference velocities. So the idea here is you have a uh, Tommy again in a dress in this time, and uh, when he slides the side rapidly, um, the wind effect will cause him to have his dress fly over. And this this can be this is realistic, but it can be troublesome if you just wanted him to move quickly and not you know obey all the physics of the wind. So one of the solutions was to have an expression in your wind field which counteracts that. So basically speed up the wind to correspond with Tommy's local motion. So you can do this with this uh, point velocity extract x form approach. Um, but with uh, Houdini 18, we don't want to force you to do all that work. So we have a new system that builds that all in for free and also has some additional functionality. So first of all, let's just look at these, these ones. So this is with zero wind. Um, so the wind is always uh, in the zero space. In matched wind, we put the wind in the reference space of Tommy. So you can see it doesn't lag nearly so much. And what we can do now is we can add what's called a vellum reference frame. What this does is take the third input 
and it basically attaches an interest to that third input that it will cancel out the behavior of the third input. Um, the default uh, parameters, I'll just reset to those, are for um, sub-steps 1, velocity com compensation 0.5, and drag compensation 0.5. So go over what those do. So if we look here at the zero wind behavior, the first thing to note is we're currently using sub-steps of 3, and this is what needs to tie with the number of sub-steps in here. If you don't tie it up properly, um, you'll just get less accurate results because it won't be able to um, correctly determine when to apply the accelerations because um, it needs to basically sample the incoming area at the equivalent speed. Um, the next one is the velocity compensation versus drag compensation. So drag compensation is what the match wind was doing. This basically adjusts all of your wind forces uh, so that they will be in the same space as this um, third input. So a value of zero means not to do any adjustment, one means to fully change in that space, and 0.5 means to apply half of it. Um, so let's just do that, that one alone and uh, see what that looks like with the simulation. So we can see, unsurprisingly, we get half of the um, velocity compensation, the wind drag compensation. I put so that you get some of the effect without it being just torn off by the sudden motion. Of course, I set it to one, and then the wind will always be in the space of Tommy, and so we'll get very little um, lag. The velocity compensation is a little bit more subtle. This is uh, basically the the nurture of the dress is stopping um, the it from keeping up with Tommy. So when Tommy starts to accelerate to the right or to his left, um, the dress doesn't react to that until it collides with the Tommy and then starts moving. So this results in a bit of a delay and a bit of that uh, you know, collision lag. So this isn't a problem in this case, you probably want that, but with more extreme motions, you might want to cancel it out. So velocity compensation basically adds to the dress acceleration based upon the acceleration of Tommy, which means that it will have less of an effect when it'll sort of like pre-accelerate for the collisions. So at fifty percent, we see there's um, less reaction to Tommy, and if I set it up to one hundred percent, we'll have very little um, reaction to what Tommy's doing. So it's almost just simulating in a rest space. The next interesting part is what happens when Tommy spins around. We've got a very fast spin coming up here, and the the problem with this, of course, is there's not one linear. Uh, velocity, the speed at the hands are way faster than the speed at the center of Tommy. Uh, so what we can do though is we can compute the angular velocity and apply the same sort of wind, wind compensation and velocity compensation to that. And so we have that as an option for compute angular velocity. We have this off by default because um, if you compute the angular velocity incorrectly, you can get a lot of startling ghost motion. For example, if Tommy is an animated character and he bends over, it's going to think that there was um, angular velocity because the center of mass is basically rotated in that case, in which case you might have distant parts of the cloth suddenly lift up uh, in response to it. So usually it's not needed, or if you're going to use it, you might want to make sure you have a very clean reference geometry, not use deforming geometry, but you make sure it's something rigid that actually is what you want. Um, that's an important point to point out, is that the um, reference frame being used here, if I dive in, is that same sort of extract transform type trick. So it comes down to a single point at the end. So there's no need to actually give your full geometry here you can give a simplified like box or something which represents the motion you want. Um, this is also why there's an acceleration threshold here. Uh, this is to uh, mi minimize the sort of jitter you get because if you have sort of a character standing there breathing, they're moving up and down constantly, but you don't want to inherit that acceleration. So this basically will only do the velocity compensation when the acceleration is exceeded a certain threshold when it's suddenly being jerked to the right. For the next one, I'm going to do another Tommy. And this time, though, I'm going to give Tommy some wristbands. So let's see how this works out. First, I need to select some wristbands. I'm going to just turn his skin into wristbands. Kind of a gross concept there, but um, it's the easiest way to make some ad hoc uh, wristbands. I'm using Group by Lasso, a new SOP in 18. And using this, I can sort of select an area around here. And then I realize I didn't select both sides. So let's try that again with uh, select only visible turned off. So I can select both sides of his wrist. There we go. And I um, also want the other side. I 
and let's blast out that group. Delete non-selected, and let's peek it slightly. And uh, let's definitely change this look, make it a different color so we're not uh, seeing a piece of skin, because that would be rather disgusting, I think. And uh, now let's turn this into some vellum cloth. And I'll bring in the original Tommy as our occlusion geometry. I don't know why I didn't get the Tommy here. Foolish mind uh, failure on my part. I was wondering why I was not seeing the Tommy as collision geometry, but what I'm seeing as guide geometry in a vellum cloth is, of course, the constraint setup of the vellum cloth. I need to do a vellum solver um, for the collision geometry to show up. So there we go. We have uh, this is a relatively boring simulation because it's just going to uh, slide down his hands a little bit. There we go. So I'm now going to uh, make uh, Tommy flex and do some cool dance moves. Not very good dance moves because I'm not a very good uh, animator. Uh, I'm going to do that using actually the bend saw. So first I'm going to go in here and I'm going to first select again with group lasso um, just his left and right arms. So I've got something to do. So this will be the uh, left arm. And uh, his left arm is my right, so down. Oops. Go. That and then group by lasso. Grab a right arm. And so now we have left and right, and now I can go and do a bend sop. What I want to do is uh, bend his uh, left arm here at the uh, elbow. So enter the bend state. And the bend state here has a set capture region option. So first, I guess I'll restrict it to only bend in the left arm. Let's see if I got the correct arm there. Okay, so that seems to be okay. I just need to get the right uh, capture region. So I'll set the capture region. If I just click the forearm, for example, here, I'll note that it actually put it off in the distance, which is not where I want it. So instead, I can, uh, when I do set capture region, go to the magnet and right-click magnet and say interior snapping. And so that will then try and find the interior of whatever I click on. So grab there to there, oops, wrong way around. Let me try that again. Set the capture region, magnets on, click from there to there, and now I have one that actually follows the forearm. forearm. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, of course, it's going like bend his arm like jello, so I need to hit G to control the length of the capture region and just bring it back to make sure the bend happens close to the arm. Um, not very realistic, of course, but there we go. Let's do the same thing on the other side. So do another bend. And this one I will set to the right arm. Enter the state, set the capture region, make sure I've got snapping on, front to front, and then G, bring this back to be a small area. Oh, it's not. Bending the root name wrong. I have the root name wrong. Right arm. Let me see. Well, needless to say, you want to be consistent with whether you use underscores or not. So there, for example, I use underscores in one case and not the other. So now I've got uh, two captured arms. Um, so what I'm going to do with this is now add a simple animation. So let's reset these bend values to zero. And let's actually be more fun and uh, add a twist value too. And I'm going to, I'm on frame one. And we'll first keyframe these. Alt left mouse button uh, will let me just set a keyframe on, on each of them. You can go forward to frame 24 or so. And now let's uh, bend this arm up and rotate his hand a bit. There we go. 
hit K will key the active parameters and the pending keys that is. So again, I can go here and rotate them around. K. And um, now let's do something faster at like 48 frames in. That's a crazy motion. Uh, unbend it. But then I'll just fly it upwards at 50. This is just to give some ridiculous motion to this particular um, bracelet. There we go. Let's see what this looks like. And see the bracelets um, follow up. And then this one goes down slowly. And then it'll fly right up very fast. You can see a lot of uh, a lot of motion there. See, it's left with tons of motion at the end, which has to resolve. So our, our sort of question is whether or not we can try and damp some of that extra motion. And this is, um, you might think, having just done the reference frame stuff, this might be a case you can do a reference frame. And it's true you can. The problem is the reference frame for this um, wristband is not the reference frame of Tommy. Tommy himself is not really moving. It's just his arm that's moving. So it is possible, because uh, the reference frame can be changed on a per point basis, that these particular points of the cloth could have a reference frame on some extracted proxy geometry where you delete out this hand and use that as your reference frame. Um, but it's sort of easier just to have them automatically attached to whatever point they're nearest to and say, um, please blend in the velocities of that point. And uh, we can do that, actually, because we have vellum attach to geometry. So if I do vellum attach to geometry, um, by default, this is going to attach the closest location in the primitive. Um, so if I look here, we can see all of the wristbands have now um, snapped themselves onto Tommy's geometry with relatively strong forces. So at this point, we're going to have um, uh, less motion, but it's because we've really strongly constrained them with distance constraints to where they should be. But we might not want them like locked in place like that. We want some motion of the the wristband to ride up and down the arm, um, but we also want to dampen its velocity relative to the surface of that arm. So we can do that uh, with the attachment constraints. There's a new option uh, for the velocity blend. And setting this to a non-zero amount will actually blend in the velocity of whatever it's attached to, to that point velocity. And so in this case, we'll grab 10% of the arm's velocity and merge it into our current velocity. And if we do that, we immediately get a red flag. Um, that's because it cannot auto-compute the velocity of the target geometry. You need to actually have a velocity attribute present. And so we can do that easily. We just have to do a point velocity SOP. And the point velocity SOP will then allow us to run forward. And now this will be inheriting the velocity of the nearby points. So we'll start to be able to actually anticipate the motion. So collisions will be doing a lot less in this case and there'll be less overshoot and less need for the, um, the cloth to react. But it's still able to move freely on that surface, uh, so it's not uh, pinned. Well, actually, that's a bit of a lie. Right now it is pinned, um, because I did not change the stiffness. The stiffness was left at the default. But I can change it to zero, and now we are only using the velocity blend in, so we can see actually the, uh, the wristband flop around a bit and can, can rest there, but it's still able to anticipate so it shouldn't have as much of a effect. So now it's, it's less uh, jiggly at the end because most of the velocity was dealt with. Let's push that up to a full one velocity bend, blend for completeness sake.
and see now that there's just a little slide here at the end, but there's no, so it's not being attached in physical location, it's being damped with the velocity damping. This is a very useful way to um, really calm down fabric um, in places where you know you want it to follow some base geometry, um, but you don't want to stitch it directly to that. You just want to sort of have like a local wind that drags it to the speed of that collision geometry. So that covers the things I wanted to cover for what's new in 18. Um, I hope this has been of help to you, and I look forward to the cool things you can do um, using Vellum. So thank you very much.